Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of V Brown Bag, your weekly video podcast where we get together with fun and illuminating people from various technological uh, areas and uh, have fun and uh, shoot the poo. Mr. May, how are you doing this evening? I'm wonderful, man. How are you? <laughs> I I am very excited to get this entire. So this is the kickoff of the. 2023 v brown bag python learning series all right um normally what happens is i go to pycon and i troll the expo hall floor for unsuspecting victims who then fall into my trap of getting coerced into coming on to v brown bag not knowing what they're going to be getting into and for some reason for the past couple of years i haven't been able to do that ha I don't know what it is. It's some kind of uh, oh, that's right. We had a pandemic. Oh, <laughs> go go figure. Go figure. So, the last time we did this was was actually four years ago in 2018. Um, I went to Pi me and me and Calvin went to PyCon and and uh, you know scooped up as many humans as as possible and uh, had a wonderful I want to say half a year long series on on Python. Mm. Um, it was very well received by our audience. Uh, folks were very happy to segue from like systems administrations they wanted to get into python they want to learn how to do programming in general and uh and so it was it was really fun i i learned a, an absolute ton and people have been saying chris why aren't you doing this again and i was like well because we've had a pandemic and it's mm -hmm. hard to, it's hard to meet new people during a pandemic so, so so uh we're doing it again we went to pycon for 2023 and we are now back in the saddle with some fun python learning and mr may unsuspectingly fell into my clutches on the expo hall floor and uh, i got him and here you are sucker <laughs> <laughs> so um this evening we are getting into refactoring your python code without losing your mind and our presenter this evening is the wonderful and generous chris may um, he is an author for Everyday Superpowers, and uh, what ran literally ran across me. He said, "Hey, Chris, I'm Chris," and I was like, "Hey, Chris, I'm Chris," mm -hmm. and and uh, and and it was kismet. It was it was uh, meant to be. Before we get into the actual meat and potatoes of this presentation, though, let's, a couple of quick show notes. If you are on Twitter, I will be following the at v brown bag account and hashtag and paying attention to the hashtag v brown bag hash, um, hashtag um, if you have any questions and you want to pose them please feel free to at us there or if you are in the studio audience tonight feel free to pop a question into the q a i will field them for the author uh publisher instructor tutor and coach of python mr chris may and i, I highly recommend that you follow him on twitter uh, he is underscore chris may and he has some really fun and interesting things to, to talk about on there. I, I was I was scrolling through your your feed and I was like, I, I had like 10 things to Google just just from like the first two or three <laughs> three things. I was like, I don't even know what that means. I need to know oh, about this. It's great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Plus, Sorry, you know, that was a lot. You can tell I'm excited. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, this entire time I've been thinking about a pun that I've been using because like we're, we're not just starting off this whole Python portion, we're christening it, right? The two of us. <gasps> nice yeah. job. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> my, mind, my mind's just been trying to figure out how to sneak that one in. So thank you. Oh. Just relax oh. and do that now. This this is we're going to be sick with dad jokes by the time <laughs> by the time we're finished. This is going to be fantastic. Awesome. Excellent. All right. Well, why don't I uh, do a stop share? And that way, if you want to fire up your, there we go. Nice. And I'm assuming that, I mean, I, I just, I just uh, waxed poetic about you, but I'm assuming that you are also going to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about everyday superpowers and, and uh, all of the, all of the fun things that you do in your, in your coaching. Cause, cause that's, that sounds fascinating too. I think you'll probably have to ask some questions about that. I um, I kind of barely introduced myself in this talk, so so we can okay. spend a little time talking about that afterwards. Okay. All right. That, yeah. Absolutely. I have. I have. I am full of questions as always. <laughs> <laughs> good. Well, it's good to be. I'm. I'm. I, on the other hand, s suffer from never being able to or having a hard time thinking about what questions to ask in the moment. So, uh, be be thankful for that gift. Well, then, then we are playing to our strengths, aren't we? Indeed. <laughs> 
Awesome. All right. So I, I do have a ton of questions, but the, the first one that, that, well, I, you know what, how, how do you want to do this? Do you want, do you want to start this off and then, and then I will seed the questions as we go. Do you want to have a little banter first? I'm, I'm very amenable. However you want to, however you want to play this, I am at your disposal. I'm pretty open. I'm thinking, why don't we go ahead and I can kick things off and then um, I can, and then I'll, I'll pause after kind of the initial kind of intro uh, to see, <laughs> to see what you, where you are. Awesome. All right. Great. Uh, well, Chris, it was, I the, just want to thank you again for inviting me here. It's been wonderful to meet you at PyCon. Um, and I'm really excited to talk tonight because like, I don't know about you, but I love it when I enjoy my job. And as I've been doing research over the last few years, I've learned that improving your code, especially through refactoring, uh, is key to helping you, or it's one avenue to help you enjoy your job more. Um, and to kind of prove my point a little bit, I found one incredible example on this blog post by this uh, developer, Alex Everloaf. So he's a senior developer in a, um, he actually didn't say what company he works for, but uh at, uh, recently here, at, at some point, he was transferred from one team to another, and his he was struggling from day one. He said that he could not make sense of the code base that he had to work on on the new team, and he was frustrated. And this is a man with 19 years of programming experience, a senior level developer. He even had almost a decade of experience in the, 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 the stack that this program was in. Mm -hmm. Um, a simple task would take him multiple days longer than he thought it should, and he felt dumb and helpless. Sadly, he wasn't alone. Uh, the whole team was struggling with technical debt. And as Alex said, leadership did not care about the code quality as long as stories were delivered on time. As a result, corners were cut and tests were skipped. I don't know about you, but this actually sounds like a, most of my project. <laughs> I was going to say that's uh, yeah yeah that's that's par for the course right there yeah right <laughs> um, the while I can relate to this I feel like he might be throwing leadership under the bus a little bit um, and that's because they're not in the code mm -hmm. right like they need to care about the things you know that are important to the business right and making sure we are, they're making money so that we can earn our salaries mm -hmm. and so they they don't know they wouldn't know necessarily when code is good or, or, or is bad. And so it's uh, it's about us developers. It's on us to make sure that our code quality is good. And if the leadership does need to worry about bad code quality, something really bad has happened. And that's essentially what happened to Alex and his team. So what'd they do about it? They had a kind of come together moment, had a meeting where they could have an honest conversation as my phone starts going <laughs> off. Oh no, I just always, realized that. Always happens. And not only that, but it's a it's an alarm, so that's gonna go off every nine minutes until I adjust it. You know, let me uh, uh since since this is a highly uh uh you know regimented and uh rigorous. Yeah, I'm gonna switch cameras <laughs> go so I go can ahead. just go ahead and <laughs> sorry everyone. <laughs> Why don't we just go ahead and uh there we are. Just go with this camera for the rest of it. <laughs> nice. Thanks. Um, right. So they had an honest conversation about the problem, which I really feel like, honestly, like that is amazing. I don't know about you, but to me, there are so many times we're in a, on a team I'm on, we just kind of deal with things. And and honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if that's exactly what Alex and his, his team did for a long time, just dealt with it, felt like status quo was okay. But I imagine eventually had to bubble up and they were like, we have to do something about this. In this conversation, the developers initially said that they wanted to stop all new features so that they can focus on cleaning everything up. Management, I think rightly so, pushed back and said, you know, we understand you're having trouble, but we've got new features we need to get out. We have bugs we need fixed. We need to like keep working on new stuff. Is there some way we can like come to uh, negotiate a, a compromise, a, a solution? And the compromise was that they decided that they were going to reserve every other Friday to reduce technical debt. Hmm. Alex said that initially it was even hard to defend spending 10% of the team bandwidth on cleaning their code, but the payback was huge. Now, neither 
Alex nor anyone on his team thought about measuring performance or metrics, which honestly is really challenging to do with development, right? Like it's, I've, I've looked into it and, and like, it, it's hard, it's hard to measure. Nonetheless, there were clear results that came from this process. First off, the code quality improved, which, you know, you kind of hope so, considering that was the focus. Secondly, they realized that they started delivering features faster. Additionally, like essentially downtime was almost in completely eliminated. And, all, you know, I think that's pretty much what he means by embarrassingly unnecessary incidents. Probably could have included some other kinds of embarrassing bugs, but that was incredible. Additionally, when they did have a tight deadline, because of their refactoring and improving their code, they were able to make better judgment calls on how to cut corners. And then were able to fix those uh, corners and, and square everything back up much quicker. They also enjoyed their work more and inspired other teams to do the same. All right, so we've been talking for a little while. My next slide may be the most important of, of this whole deck. So let me do that and we can pause. Oh. Most of us are too focused on getting features out the door. But if we were to regularly take even a small percentage of our time to improve our code, we can reap huge benefits. Boom. What do you think? Are, are we done? Can we, are we just, just shut it down now? That's the, that's the, <laughs> that's the slide. We're, okay, and, and we're finished. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Wait, no, whatever. We, we... <laughs> and drink. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, I mean, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. My, my question is, is the how, like yes. when, when we say how to improve, improve the code, what, what does that mean? What, what are, what are we talking about? How do we measure uh, performance? What I, I immediately go into engineering mode of improve is a very fuzzy word for me. So, so tactically, what is that? How does that be accomplished? How does that be accomplished? My English mm -hmm. is getting shot. How yeah. is that accomplished? <laughs> That is an excellent question. And in fact, I, if you want me to, I can move on and we can actually hit that pretty quickly. Wunderbar. All right. I, I love it when I tee it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, just to cover a little bit of an agenda for the talk, uh, intro to refactoring is what I'm going to do next, just to kind of, you know, lay the groundwork to understand what refactoring is. I'm going to, there in my research, I found that there are two kinds of refactoring advice. So I'm going to explore that, show you an example of refactoring, kind of try to drive home, if you aren't convinced yet, why you should refactor and then give you a couple of resources to, to help you learn how to refactor or to just help you out in general. There aren't just refactoring advice. Um, and then to also start off, uh, to introduce, briefly introduce myself, my name is Chris May. As Chris said, I'm a Python technical coach, um, which means essentially that I have the privilege to temporarily come alongside of a team and make lasting change by improving the way they write code, talk about code, communicate within a team, and just in, help them introduce better practices into the into the team. Uh, as Chris said, uh, my website is everydaysuperpowers.dev. That's where you can find all sorts of resources I'm, I'm creating, as well as my blog. Um, but now, now I want to transition to what is refactoring, because, and, and honestly, it comes, it comes to the point of why I created this talk. And it's because I had a misunderstanding of refactoring that really held me back throughout my career. And it I notice it in other people too. It, it, it's held back the teams I was on and even the people I work with every day. So let's lay the groundwork. What is refactoring? The definition is improving code without changing its behavior. The reason we refactor, number one, is to make code more understandable because understandable code is easier to maintain and has fewer bugs in it. Additionally, when there are bugs in it, they are much easier to fix. We also refactor to support new directions. And by that, I mean like, you know, right now your project is doing one thing or maybe a couple, you know, things it's going in one direction, but something's going to change one day and you're going to have to support a new direction. And when you refactor, it gives you that flexibility to support new directions. So that's what refactoring is. As I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, as I've looked at the my research and like I looked at all the refactoring advice I could find out there, it really falls into two different categories and I've labeled them top down and bottom up refactoring. Top down 
is the vast majority of refactoring advice you'll see out there. It and, and this advice kind of started, you know, like in the 50s and 60s and 70s. There's a lot of papers, a lot of research that was gotten into uh, why it's so hard to change programs. Like uh, I read this paper about um, it, it was in like I can't remember it was like 73, 75, somewhere in there where they were talking about the developers spent you know all this money creating the initial version of this code and delivered it to the customer. And of course, Agile wasn't like super big back then. So what they did then was like, okay, now we're going to try to figure out what's going to be in version two or 1.5 or whatever. And then they would work on that. And the paper was saying that it took um, more time to do the second version on the same code base than did the first. So hmm. for decades, they've been trying to figure out how can we make our code more reusable, more easier to edit. And for decades, it kind of built on and built on. And then finally, in, in the 90s, Martin Fowler kind of curated the ideas that were floating around into this book. Um, one drawback about this book with regard to Python is that this book was written in Java. And a lot of this advice, it's kind of focused, especially as written for like languages like C and Java that are not as flexible as Python. Nonetheless, like you can translate it into Python and it's still really good advice. Uh, additionally, one thing that's kind of I find interesting about this top down versus bottom up is that there are destinations you can take your code to. And I say that because it's like the advice doesn't know exactly what you're trying to do or what your code does, but they instead are saying, we have a number of ways you can improve your code. You just have to choose the right ones for your for your project, of which there are many. <laughs> many to to be familiar with to choose um but you know just kind of reading through them like like what honestly this is what kind of held me back from refactoring for a long time um you know i i saw a couple of videos of of developers like refact doing amazing job of refactoring through their code base and it inspired me and i'm like i'm going to get this book i'm going to read it i'm going to be a great refactorer and then I got hit in the face with this, all these refactoring methods and the kind of the way they were written about, it just was hard for me to absorb. And honestly, I just kind of let it sit to the side for years. But good news is I can, people have figured out like you, you can kind of boil these down into six steps. And that's what these are. And essentially to kind of gloss over it, you make sure that tests cover what you want to change. You duplicate that code, adjust the new code to cover all the cases you need, reroute the original code to new code, delete the old code, and run your tests to make sure everything works. Oh. So I still, you know, th this is good. And it's good to keep in mind, especially if you don't have access to those whole list of 60 plus refactoring methods. Um, yeah, but even still, like I, I one thing I really appreciate out of those refactoring methods is they have specific things that you need to be concerned about or worry about, or, or and actually I should take a step back. You don't need to worry about it because they've thought through everything and they give you a checklist of things you can think about and do to make sure everything works and you don't accidentally introduce bugs. Pretty, pretty good stuff. So that covers top down refactoring. The other style of refactoring I call bottom up. Bottom up starts with your code as it exists today. And then it is a series of small steps that you can apply to your code that actually allows good design to emerge from your code. And honestly, I was blown away by this. Very, I'm very impressed with the people who came up with this. This comes from the book, 99 Bottles of Object-Oriented Programming by Sandy Metz and Katrina Owen. Uh, they are two Ruby developers who wrote this book because they they, they're developers and trainers, and they just have a passion for teaching people. And they wanted to write a book to say, like, like there, there's a lot of object-oriented books out there that are very academic. They wanted to write a book that's like, you know, really good, practical advice that you can apply to your daily life with regards to object-oriented programming. And as a part of that, they a very important part of this is to try to teach people how to refactor. And they they realized they needed to figure out some kind of new solution to help people refactor. And they came, came up with what they call the flocking rules. 
after over two years of working at it and trying to figure out how to do this. Language. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> oh, flocking. Okay. Flocking rules. Okay. My I... bad. My bad. <laughs> Indeed. This is a kid show. <laughs> uh, well, here, in just a second, I'm going to take you through the flocking rules. Do you have any questions this far, Chris? No, no, this is, this is absolutely exactly where I, I'm. This is fantastic. Okay, cool. I, I am a sponge. You're a sponge. Okay, cool. Well, um, well then let me show you. On the left here are the flocking rules. And on the right is just a, a snippet of code that um, creates the first two verses to the 12 days of Christmas. Just an, ex an example of code, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's in as far as domain is very different from what you do every day. But when you actually try to write code that generates song lyrics, it's surprising, like how similar you, the problems are. So let me just take you through a sample refactoring using the flocking rules. Mm -hmm. Step one, identify what to work on which I must say very right from the get-go, I find that this, I'm very thankful that they included this as a part of the, reflo the flocking rules because it's amazing how many times it's hard to know where to start, you know? Um, so this is a nice, you know, glide path to get you, to get you into refactoring. To identify what to work on, you look for the things that are most alike in your program. In this case, we have two verses. So once you identify that, now you want to find the smallest difference between them. And I would suggest that it would be the third word of, the, of each verse, because otherwise the first line is exactly the same. So now that we've identified this, we want to make them identical. And to do this, we want to run, we want to have tests first, which is a topic in and of itself, um, which I, have, I can help you with in, at the end. But after every step, every change, we want to run our tests to make sure we don't introduce any bugs or change behavior. Mm -hmm. So. First, we need to create a component to resolve variations. The idea is as we are making things more and more alike, at some point, things are going to be different. And we want to have a something in code to say, this is where we are. Can you give can you return back the difference? What the the specific code or thing data that we need at this point? Hmm. In order to create something, we need to name it which is one of the hardest things to do in programming. And Sandy and Katrina, um, they learned this from somebody else, but I learned it from them. So I'm giving them the hat tip. They recommend creating like a little table to say what's gotta be true. So in this case, when the variable verse is one, this thing needs to return first. Mm -hmm. when, versus, when verse is two, second, five, fifth, and so on. So when I look at the relation between like one and first, three and third, the word that comes to mind is nth. So we need to create a function called nth. So we've introduced new code, we run our tests, they pass, we can move on to the next step, which is to implement the code to supply one variation. So in this case, I'm just going to return first, we've changed code, we run our tests, they pass, we move on. Now we want to replace one of the differences with a call to that new component. So in the first verse, we're just going to turn it into an f string, and change first to a call to nth. We run our tests, they pass, we move on. Now we can delete any unused code, and at this time, we don't have any. So step five is to now repeat step two until the differences are eliminated. So come back up to step two. This time we can skip number one because we are still working on a component we've just created. But this time we implement code to supply the other variation, so we can do it just like this. We run our tests and they fail. This is why it's so important to have tests because it's so easy to just focus in and just get to working, especially like you, once you get good at the, the flocking rules or any kind of refactoring, you're just gonna go rapidly through making all these little changes and you can just kind of get narrow focused and just miss something just like I did when I did this. <laughs> and what happened is when I created the new codes to supply the second um, variation, I introduced a parameter in such a way that the first verse broke it, right? We, the first verse doesn't have a way, doesn't have a parameter to pass in at this time. So I broke the code. What I should have done instead is up in the nth function, add a default parameter just like that. And now I can run my tests and they pass. 
So sometimes that's that's one of the tricky things with refactoring is to think, how can I introduce code in a way that doesn't break anything? Thankfully, if you have tests, you break something and then you're like, oh, okay, well, you can just take a step back and kind of think, think it through. Now we're on to step three. We want to replace the other difference. So we're going to do the same thing with verse two, turn it into an F string and call out to, ver or to, to nth. We put on a test, they pass. We don't have any code to, to delete, so we go back. This time we can skip down to part three and adjust the first verse to include verse. Run our tests. Now we can delete used code, uh, unused code that is. So back in the nth, now we don't need that parameter so we can get rid of it. That'll help us in the future. And now the first two lines are exactly the same. We have successfully completed a refactoring. The thing I love about the flocking rules is now you can actually go right back up to the top and say, is there something else we want to refactor? You know, like in this case, I imagine we would want to start refactoring the list of gifts and and try to figure out how to make that better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Congratulations. We've refactored, we've refactored code. <laughs> Huzzah! <laughs> and any questions at this point? So when when you when you take this into the real world, mm -hmm. what are the things that you're that you're trying to do to the uh, is when when you when you initiate a refactoring effort, yeah, are, are you trying to improve the performance? Are you trying to improve the readability? Is it is it all every, everything like like what like when in in reality like what what are the things that people go for? Great question. Um, I would say first off, and I thought this was fascinating when I came across this is that performance is like the least concern. Really? Um, okay. Yeah. Unless you're unless you specifically want performance. Okay. Um. Um. You know, which is, you know, obviously at times like you definitely want that, but you really should do readability and understandability. Number one, those are, if, if they're the same thing, they're the number, top priority. Otherwise, you know, mm -hmm. they share top priority. And in fact, there's um, Ward Cunningham. Um, I believe he's still alive. He coined the term technical debt. Mm -hmm. And 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 there's something I learned just last week that that about this, uh, it just blowing my mind and it's really inspiring me right now. We use technical debt to essentially mean um, maintenance that we have introduced but haven't cleaned up, right? Like I kind of talked about that during the Alex's and his team, like you know, to to try to meet a deadline, they're they're putting code in and it's not the best code, and maybe there's extra duplication. Maybe I think in particular, if it's hard to understand, you know, that's technical debt or how we mean technical debt. Um, Ward Cunningham, when he coined the term, um, he was working on a piece of financial software and was trying to communicate to his boss this idea of uh, essentially not going back and like learning something, but not going back and applying it to the code. That's what he means by technical debt. And um, essentially, yeah, I was trying to explain why the, where the term came from, but he had this quote that said essentially, what it was very important to him and his team is as they would learn about their code and their domain of the code, they it was important for them to go back to the code and edit it so that number one, um, it looked easy. And number two, it looked as though they knew what they were doing the whole time. <laughs> Which is such a fascinating thing, you know? And actually he said it looked easy in small talk because that, that was the language he was using. But I was just thinking, and I'm, 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 what I'm tra actually challenging myself with the, the, the next couple of weeks is to say, like, when I'm writing code, how can I, like, before I check it in to get, how can I make it look like it's, like, this code is easy in Python and mm -hmm. make it very understandable? Because, you know, like I said earlier, if you have understandable code, it's hard for there to, for bugs to exist there. Um, so, yeah, a long-winded way to say readability, understandability, top-notch. Nice. I, I like the fact that he was making financial software and then coined the term technical debt, probably trying to explain it to a CFO. See, you've got this debt, but it's technical. <gasps> we'll call it technical debt. <laughs> Indeed. And it was uh, um, investment software too. So even more to the point that they were, right. Perfect. you know, <laughs> debt is bad. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Cool. Any other questions?
Oops, I've accidentally. No, 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 no. Uh, please continue. This is amazing. All right, cool. So we've covered what refactoring is, how you refactor, uh, multiple ways you can refactor. I kind of glossed over top down. It's still important, but you know, I really wanted to, especially because the bottom up refactoring technique is very new. It's only been, I don't even know it's five years old at this point. Yeah. So, so it's, you don't see as much stuff out there about that, but now I want to inspire you. I want you to refactor. And so uh, I want to talk about uh, Brett Slacken because three minutes into his talk at PyCon 2016, Brett mentioned these words. Great programmers write code that makes so much sense, it's easy to understand. Most people stop at the point where the code works, but a great programmer continues on and refactors the code base so that it's easy to understand and the code is obvious. They do this because it provides a better foundation for the future. Over the long run, it saves you time. I mean, mm -hmm. Talking about, you know, refactoring to make sure it's, it's easy to understand, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, to figure out how I could give an example of this. Um, so I found that this code base online. It's actually a refactoring uh, kata or, or exercise. And this code is an API endpoint that computes prices for ski lift tickets. And as you can see here, as I scroll down, there is a lot of logic in there that's easy to get wrong. And especially for me, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of Boolean... Um, Oh man, I've already forgotten the word. Like, like just challenged, Boolean challenge. You know, like oh, I am too mathematically challenged. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I would not really want to maintain this software at all. So what I decided to do was refactor it. Right. So I I did that, and this is the code that I produced. Um, when I refactored this software, the I knew that like the idea of a ticket is really important to this code. So I created a class of ticket to kind of describe, mm -hmm. this is a thing that exists. And then I created kind of specialized classes to say like, you know, and as you can see here, there's a night ticket and, and each of these classes calculate their price. They're, they're responsible for calculating the price of themselves. And so if I scroll down, you'll see that down here is what I call the normal ticket or probably the day pass as I realize later. Um, but as I said, they're responsible for calculating their prices, which is nice because, like, if you need to calculate, if you need to change how up um, how a, a ticket kind is priced, you know exactly where to go to get it. Mm. But honestly, I felt like there was an opportunity to improve this. Um, so, at a different time, I decided to try refactoring the same original code using the four flocking rules, um, and this is the code that I created. And this is all of it. So this this is much simpler, much, it's, you know, actually shorter code is a little bit easier to generally, I should say, it, you can make short code that's really hard to understand. But I feel like this is a much better job of explaining what's going on. Mm. Not that the code before was bad or even that this is necessarily better. I'm sure you can even make a better version of this because I limited myself to a very short period of time and, and you know, kind of got, you know, very to the point of trying to get this kind of, concise and then called it a point without, you know, obsessing over it. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I feel like this code does a better job of being a little more obvious, a little, at least a little more traceable. And yeah. And not to say that the other code is bad, right? Because I do believe like, let's say that we had like five different types of tickets code like that might be more in line with what we want to do. Um, but yeah, I just thought this was a good example to show how to improve readability. At least I hope hope it's a good example. It is, it is, and and they all work and and they all pass their tests. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Which is actually in in some ways one of the great things about Python is that you can find ways to be more expressible. And I think that's part of what Ward Cunningham was talking about is like how can you make it look easy? And I feel like this one looks maybe a little bit easier. I don't, I don't know. I'm still working with that. Yeah, you know, obviously it's a new idea to me, and I'm trying to trying to figure out how how to make it work in my own in my own life. Well, as, as a nascent baby programmer, I can tell you that this one makes the most sense of, mm. of the, of the three that you showed me of the, of the, the Kata refactors. This one is the one that I can grok the easiest. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. That goal, <laughs> goal accomplished. Cause that's exactly what I want. Good. So as Brett was talking about this, he had these words on, on the screen, mm -hmm. but, but he spoke these out loud. 
on his screen, he had this graphic. And I find this graphic interesting. Obviously, he said it's anecdotal. Um, but one thing I thought was interesting was number one, how self de self deprecating he was, because like as he said, most programmers just do what it takes to get it to work and then move on. And he lumped himself into that category. Right, right. But he was saying that the best developers he knows spends at least or uh, uh, roughly half their time refactoring their code. Half their time that like even still like that is hard for me to swallow, but it makes it's so interesting. Like, like if under, if your goal is to write understandable code, editing it makes a lot of sense. But like, I don't know, to me, like, I, I don't, like I said, I, well, I, when on the teams I've been a part of, we rarely refactored. We rarely spoke of refactoring. Mm. To us, refactoring was kind of a very painful process where like we would send the senior developer off to like, you know, clean up code or introduce a new um, dependency or something. We'd call it refactoring. They'd finish after a couple of weeks. And then we'd have to try to marry their code into our code. And it just was painful to do. So we, at best, we would do it twice a year, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this kind of blew my mind. But I was wondering, do other people have this kind of viewpoint? Is there any synergy here? And it just happened that I got to talk to Heinek Schlawlock, who created adders or data classes, if you're familiar with it. And he told me that he actually doesn't think of refactoring as a separate thing. To him, it's just the result of having tests and thinking about the design of your code all the time, which I kind of think is kind of like what Ward Cunningham was getting to as well, you know, because mm -hmm. it's almost like you, when you think of like really great authors, they're ruthlessly editing their work. And it seems like the best Python developers do as well. So something I'm, I'm obviously mess thinking about a lot. and. If I haven't sold you yet on refactoring, I have one more thing. <laughs> Alex and his team, these are the benefits that they got just by spending 10% of their time refactoring. Actually, it was a little less, as he says, and, and it was a little less than 10%, but we're just going to call it 10%. But I kind of skipped over. I just kind of glossed over the last two when I talked about it. But I want to kind of drill in because <laughs> can you imagine you're working with a group of people, you're, you're, you're in an office. And, you know, you're in the kitchenette and, you know, you kind of look over and there are a couple of people from another team walking by and they've got smiles on their faces. They're just joshing around and just having a great time as they walk by. And you see a friend of yours on that team. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa what's going on? What you guys are usually depressed. You, you, <laughs> you've been why, hating your job. Why aren't you miserable like me? <laughs> exactly. Right. Because, you know, and, and, and say, well, what, what's been going on? And, and that your friend says, oh, well, we've convinced our leadership to like spend 10% of our time refactoring and improving our code. And my God, it's made so much difference. I mean, like we're delivering things faster. We have fewer bugs. It's so much more fun to work on this code. Mm -hmm. and, and people in the other teams are like, oh, my God, I tell us how to do that. We want to do the same thing. Like that could happen to you. So. I want you to refactor. And if you need some help, I thought maybe I could recommend three resources to, to help you refactor. Mm. First one, 99 Bottles of Logic Dorning Pro Programming. It is an incredible book. Um, it's written in Ruby. They also have JavaScript and PHP versions if you're mm. kind of more familiar with those. The wonderful thing about this compared to say the refactoring book that I showed before is that Ruby is not so different to Python, like, like you can translate it much easier. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, you know, if you are reading this and you're trying to figure out how do I translate into Python, reach out to me because I would love to help. Like, honestly, mm -hmm. like I, I found this such an interesting problem to solve and I actually learned a lot about Python in the process, um, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. So that's a Ruby book. I really wanted to get a really good Python book. And so I'm going to suggest robust Python. It doesn't talk a thing about refactoring, but as somebody who wants to refactor, this book does an amazing job of saying, um, helping you to think about what code you want to use to communicate specific things to your teammates. Mm. Um, you know, 
pa um, Patrick did an incredible job. I, I really appreciate that. Like he's like, you know, when would you use a tuple versus a list or a dictionary? And he does a really good job of saying these things communicate different things. And I, I really appreciate it. It has elevated my my Python um, sniffing a good bit. Nice. And then finally, I wanted to recommend a really good um, Python refactoring book. And I couldn't find one. So I created it. Uh, I've made <laughs> the Python refactoring toolkit. Essentially, it I've taken as much fact, refactoring advice as I could find and translated it into Python. Um, so those 60 some odd refactoring techniques I showed you before, in the Python toolkit, I have translated them into Python, even given a couple examples of like, if you if you feel more like, you know, classes, you can use this example, if you feel like more like functions, this example. So uh, depending on the different, the different refactoring techniques. And uh, so yeah, so if you're interested in that, go to my website at everydaysuperpowers.dev slash toolkit, download a free sample, see if it's for you. Um, yeah, uh, other than that, that's, that's my talk about refactoring and I'd love to answer your questions. Wait, can can you go back to the uh, to the other slide with the? Uh... Right. No, no, no. Uh, after that one. Oh, this one. Yes, that one. Okay. Got it. Hold on one second. I'm just going to grab a screenshot. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so they can put it in the show notes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, so I, I I have a bunch of questions, but but I also yeah. want to make sure that the folks in the audience um, can can get theirs in as well. Um, in in that person's talk, where they where where they were saying that the um, satisfaction improved, everybody was happier, and and stuff like that. As again, I, I'm I'm coming at this from a baby as from a baby developer, uh, mm -hmm. as as are most of the people that are going to be watching this in the audience. What what are the um, uh, mechanisms for measuring uh, the, the success of of code as it's going through? I mean, I know a number of bugs, sure, but like. Uh, can you can you go back to the slide uh, from the guy's talk? This there we one? go. Yeah. yeah. So so how are, how are you empirically measuring code quality, and at what stage in a developer's career do they need to start thinking about refactoring and code quality and stuff like that? Like when when does that become like important? Great question. Um, the biggest thing about this is that there was no real like metric measurement. You know, they didn't, um, I have some research that that um, uh, uh, another technical coach, Emily Beach, has has turned me on to, and I haven't read the full thing yet, but essentially what she and they have, have concluded is it is very difficult to measure quality and, um, um, you know, like a performance, say, of, of a development team or a developer. Um, Especially because anytime you, as developers, apparently, like anytime you try to measure us, we do a really good job of like gaming the system to try. Yeah, that. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lines of code, okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. So, so, so that to all that to say that there is no like, like say empirical number. Um, though, yeah. Um, but but these these are kind of the the kind of I'll say the emotions. These are the things that like as the people who have lived through this, as they kind of thought about what they in particular, Alex, he he wrote this blog post, right? Mm -hmm. He kind of looking back at where he came from and where they are now, he realized like these are definitely improvements. You know, mm -hmm. I'm I do wonder if he could go go I like I feel like some things like like bugs, you know, you can do things like Jira tickets or um whatever, you know. So Ticket. it's it's going to be subjective to the code base, basically. Absolutely. Okay. All right. And to that point, you know, I feel as though beginner developers like refactoring, like the rule I always think about whenever I'm about to check in code is, will I understand this in six months? <laughs> if I went by that metric, I would never submit anything. I would never. <laughs> I would never commit a line of code. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because like that's. The, um, um, I want to say even in Martin Fowler's book, he one of the things he talks about is, let's say that there's a, a you know a line of code that, um, uh, I'm just trying to think of a good example like there. So like back in the the um, ski lift example, one mm -hmm. uh, one idea I had was there was like this this couple of lines of code that like checked to see like all these different things, 
And I turned that chunk of code into a function using the extract method um, refactoring technique. Mm -hmm. And the idea is you, you essentially like take that code, put it into a function, but name the function a very clear name as to what that code does and stick it in, you know, where that previous code was. So mm -hmm. instead of seeing, you know, um, is uh, is holiday equal to this huge, you know, chunk of code, you just see it go into this function that like says, you know, is this a month, is this a weekend that is not, you know, a holiday or something? I can't remember what I called it, but it's so much more, you know, like he said, creating, extracting a function is always a good, it essentially generally a good idea, even if the function name is longer than the code it replaces, because it just increases understandability. And reusability. Yeah. And reusability. Okay. Absolutely. That makes sense. Uh, Robbie just made an interesting comment. Um, uh, the, the, the uh, it probably also coincides with deprecated dependencies or new features added into the standard library. Mm. So, yeah. So as, as things are phasing out and new things are coming in, you can, you can go about a refactor leveraging uh, new tools. Absolutely. And one thing to that too, I was just thinking, um, one thing I learned from Sandy and Katrina, another thing I learned from them is like if code is working and, you know, like, like, let's say you just have like a, a part of your code base that's just gnarly and nobody knows what it does, but it just does it right. Mm -hmm. But you mm -hmm. don't need to change it. Don't change it. Like it, the important point is not to make your whole, whole code base you know, this amazing piece of, of, you know, the, the best written code ever. This is elegant art. Do not touch my creation. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> because like, you're going to, if you try to do that, you're going to spend so much more time on gnarly code that already works mm -hmm. when your boss is paying you to develop new features. So, um, you know, the, I, like, I feel like what I've been trying to figure out for myself is like how much refactoring is worth it, you know? And I feel like if it's code that I am writing, if it's, you know, in the same file, it's fair game, mm -hmm. essentially, mm -hmm. you know, if it's, okay. yeah. Yeah, that, that is an interesting point. Like, like, what is the ROI on, on time sunk into refactor? I mean, it, it seems like 10%. I mean, well, for, for them, it was 10%. But again, I think that that would probably also be dependent upon the code base yeah. is, is what, what makes sense. Because honestly, uh, when when you say um, you know that gnarly chunk of code, nine times out of ten, I don't know why it's working. I yeah. just know that it, I just know that it is working. And and when when I'm I shouldn't probably say that out loud on a recording. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you know it's it's like okay I can I can start refactoring this, but then I break it all. And mm -hmm. and but then that goes back to testing. We have, we've actually got a number of really good uh, testing. Um, presentations for okay. this series. We've got Brian Aachen coming in and Mike Excellent. Kennedy is going to talk about testing. And, and I, th I think um, uh, Eric Mathis is also going to talk about the PyTest section of his book. Nice. So, so uh, yeah, we're, we're going heavy on the testing this year because, awesome. because that's something that we missed out on last year. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to see, watch those too, because like kind of similar to how Sandy and Katrina said that they, they needed to figure out how to explain refactoring to people. Mm -hmm. I feel like we need somebody like that to do testing. Cause like, yes, it's, you know, maybe coming up with a framework or something to kind of help because, you know, and maybe it already exists out there. I just have, I'm not familiar with it, but that's something that I'm doing research on right now as well. Mm, nice. To, to that point, actually, um, just in case, uh, cause um, at the Python web conference, um, um, Gil Zeldabred, I think is his name. I can't mm -hmm. remember. He did a, tutorial on refactoring and he had a fascinating idea um that i that i want to sp spread because i didn't know about it um mm -hmm. uh and it comes from there's a, a another technical coach who uh lou ellen falco who created a um package uh python package actually it's in multiple languages called approval tests and i thought the thing i love about it is that if you don't have any test coverage because I mean, let's face it, like the vast majority of the projects I worked on had no tests at all or <laughs> tests I wrote to try to get things started. And then we just, you know, my teammates didn't want to do that so that we didn't do that. Mm. Um, approval test has an interesting thing where if you can just generate a string, right? So like if you're logging or or whatever, if you, if, if you can just say like, as a result of this function, I'm going to turn whatever result there is into a string. Mm -hmm. 
it can it can um look at that and tell you if it's changed and and throw throw an error so instead of having to think through like all the you know assert this or you know if you're using if you're using PyTest, you can do this assert. Otherwise, you have to you know self dot is equal to or whatever. Right. Instead of having to think of all that, you can just say like create a function that returns a string or you know returns an object or series of objects and convert it to a string. Mm -hmm. Hand it over to this thing, and and I say hand it over to this thing. It has a function called verify that takes a string, and it will do that. Additionally, they have a verify JSON function that so instead of turning a string, you can have a JSON string that can that can ha handle. Anyway, I thought it was a very fascinating idea um, and a good way to kind of get some tests, a quick win to get tests in. Very cool. I, I will have to um, take a look. At, so this this Python web conference was the first one that I couldn't attend because it was the first week that I started my new job. Oh, no. So so unfortunately, I was not That's able right. to attend or, or, or talk. So so uh, I'll have to go back and dig through and find that one. I'll put it in the I'll put it in the show notes with this one as well. I think that they haven't released the talks yet either on YouTube. So uh, I think it was 90 days since the, yeah, it had, yeah, it had, I, I haven't been here 90 days. So yeah, um, okay. they will, they will release them in 90 days. Okay. I'll, I'll see if I can get Calvin to give me a, a, a preview copy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool. Um, let's see any questions from anybody. No. Hi from Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Uh, Robbie's comment. Let me, uh, let me double check in the tweetosphere as well. Nope, we we are clean. We are clear up. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> oh, she's saying I'm, hi, Chris. And I'm like, oh, she must be talking to me or the other Chris. She was talking to you. She <laughs> she she doesn't talk to me. She 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 ignores me roundly, as as well she should. <laughs> Amazing. This this is this is absolutely exactly what I what I hoped it would be. Thanks. Wow. That's I'm sorry. I, I I didn't I didn't mean to cut. Are 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 we are we have we wrapped? Yes, we've wrapped. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I, I, I for, for a second there, I was like, oh, crap, he did finish this, right? Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and if you have any questions that come to mind afterwards, please reach out to me. I have Twitter, Mastodon, you know, my website. I'm, I want to help people. Like, my job is to help people. So I, not to say that I'm going to charge you to help you, but I really want to help you. I, I feel like refactoring has done amazing. Like learning to refactor has elevated my code unlike anything else. And I enjoy coding so much more. Uh, I see somebody ask about LinkedIn. I wish I could remember what my LinkedIn is. It's, but if you see my face that looks like that, that's me. I think it's Chris hyphen May. No, that's GitHub. Hold on, hold on. I'll, I'll find it. I'll find one it Chris fast. May. I bet it's one Chris May. It is. Yeah. One Chris May. The number one, number yep. one Chris May. There it is right there. Cool. And I will put that in the show notes as well. Yeah. So yeah, please reach out. I Wonderful. don't bite. He, Chris does. The other Chris does. I but, absolutely um. do. <laughs> I draw blood. <laughs>